good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Sajinder, acting emergency medicine physician in Culture TH. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. And uh, it has been a great honor to speak to such an audience and also our speakers who are uh, in the top of in this field. So uh, without further ado, I'll get into the uh, presentation. So uh, Brief explanation, uh, brief uh, description, uh, history of uh, disaster management plan. Actually, uh, what uh, brought our attention that we need such a plan is tsunami that occurred in 2004. So before that, we had war, but uh, we have bomb blasts and shooting incidents, but uh, nothing in the scale of tsunami which had casualties exceeding thousands. So shortly afterwards, in 2004, in 2005, uh, this, the Disaster Management Act was brought in and uh, all the government agencies and ministries and corporations were required to uh, hand over the uh, Disaster Preparedness Plan, uh, Mass Casualty Plan for, and for us, uh, it's the Mass Casualty Plan for hospitals. And uh, this is the definition of mass casualty incidents, uh, the number of casualties exceeding the resources we have available in the community. And the management plan is to reduce the, to minimize the morbidity and mortality. <clears throat> so, uh, I think this has been talked briefly. Uh, what are the, uh, the disasters we are anticipating in our district, Paltara? So, the red dot you can see here is the rough location of Paltara uh, Teaching Hospital. And uh, as you can see, it's close to the, the district is uh, close to the sea. We can expect tsunami uh, before 2004. Actually, we didn't anticipate that. That's why uh, we had such a number of uh, casualties. And uh, the Kalugonga is there over here. And uh, during the monsoons, like uh, our previously mentioned, uh, we can have floods. And the highway, you can see it's going here again within 10 to 15 kilometers away from the hospital. And uh, the railway uh, line is going from here, close to the sea, again, within the hospital uh, uh, premises, within the hospital reach. And then we can expect landslides uh, towards the hillside of the district and uh, riots. In Beirwala and Algoma, there's multiple nations and ethical groups living close together. So uh, there has been previous uh, encounters that these uh, people, uh, there has been rise and uh, civil unrest. And the chemical disasters from rubber facilities available uh, in the district. So anticipating uh, uh, the possible mass casualty is important uh, to like to plan what our response is going to be and as well how to, uh, to plan how we are going to uh, mitigate or prevent this uh, uh, disasters. So, uh, to uh, uh, to come up with a plan, mass casualty plan, we need to identify what are the resources available in our hospital, both inside the hospital and outside the hospital. So, inside the hospital, we have a like bed capacity like uh, thousand one hundred, that's like two or three years ago, and uh, now we have a new hospital recently opened at Galester Maternal Children Hospital. So the bed capacity has changed and increased. And uh, then the availability of the wheelchairs, trolleys, and availability of ambulance. We have multiple uh, uh, hospitals uh, in the region, which we have included in our plan. And uh, with the call, we can get all the medical teams, the ambulances, and resources from that hospital to this hospital when needed. And uh, then the manpower, uh, we have close to 2,000 uh, manpower, uh, including doctors, healthcare assistants, and the nurses. And uh, then the laboratory facilities and imaging facilities, including the CT, which will be available, and uh, the quarantine facilities in case of outbreak. And uh, outside the hospital, we have the police department, the fire department, just five to 10 kilometers away, and then uh, the forces. Special Task Force Camp, the uh, uh, and the, the Navy Camp and the Air Force Camp. Navy Camp, in case of uh, floods, we can get the uh, the boat facilities. And the Air Force Camp, uh, recently also we conducted the uh, 
uh, the help of medivac uh, for the medical officers and gave the training for them. And uh, then the developing uh, pre-hospital care, the 1990 ambulances and EMT services. And now I think uh, in case of a disaster, they will be the first to get the call because uh, more than 119 and other emergency uh, calls, the people are contacting the 1990. <clears throat> So when the disaster happens, uh, the notification will reach the hospital through the police post or telephone exchange or uh, direct call to uh, direct uh, hospital of director, uh, director of the hospital and the reception desk. And uh, this information is reconfirmed by a uh, responsible authority. And uh, before uh, the major casualty incident is declared. Okay, so once the call reaches uh, the telephone exchange, the information will be taken according to the methane classification. I'm sure you all know about it. So we will get as much as much detail from this uh, uh, protocol and then relay the information to the relevant uh, authorities. And we, for that also, uh, uh, we have a clear who to call and what uh, when to call and then uh, the clear call cascade cascade it will activate the call cascade so the criteria for action activation will uh, depend on the facilities of uh, each hospital so for us we have uh, taken the casualties exceeding 25 during the day and casualties exceed, exceeding uh, 15 during the night and uh, or if the surgical team uh, declare that they can't cope up with the casualty with the available resources, then uh, the mass casualty plan will be activated. The activation of uh, mass casualty plan actually will be under director or the director authorized person. And uh, he will decide whether to stand by the plan or to activate the plan. So uh, when the director decides to activate the plan, he will inform the telephone exchange and then they will activate the communication uh, cascade. So we have a clear list of who to call the first line responders and the units, and then uh, who to call next, the second line responders and unit. So <clears throat> this is pre-arranged clear communication protocols and we mostly use the mobile phones and hosp hospital internal communication system to uh, transmit the message. So uh, the, at the incident actually in, uh, uh, in the ideal setup, uh, depending on the nature, there will be uh, the first responders will uh, kind of uh, uh, create a advanced medical post at the site of the disaster. So this is actually not happening in our country, partly due to the, the fact that we don't have the resources and it takes time, and partly because our there are good Samaritans and a uh, lot of uh, eager witnesses in the area that will uh, try to uh, try to arrange transport for the victims. They will go into the impact zone, uh, try to escape or take the uh, the affected patients and uh, put them in three wheelers or buses or even stop the private vehicles and transport the patient to the hospital. Because, uh, like previously said, uh, in their head, it's uh, it's like it's uh, wired that the hospital, the injured patient, should be taken to the hospital as soon as possible, rather to stabilize the patient at the site and then tra transfer safely to uh, with the first responders or medical staff or trained personnel. Uh, this is partly because uh, we are like even our paramedics and uh, uh, hospital staff is uh, used to the scoop and run method, like take the patient as soon as to the hospital uh, without stabilizing and spending time to assist the patient. And if there's any stabilization, it will occur inside the ambulances, as opposed to stabilizing the patient at the site, like uh, the EMTs in other countries, I think uh, they even intubate the patient there, put ICTs. 
and uh, but our the free hospital care the EMT service is not that much advanced. So mostly what we can expect is to put the cannula and get the uh, IV going on and take patient to the hospital. And in the, inside that uh, inside the ambulance, if we train the EMT staff, then we can also uh, get to triage uh, tri triage the patient. We can get them to triage the patient before reaching the hospital. Because uh, in our setting, what we are getting into the hospital is mostly untriaged patients. So, uh, and uh, the like, uh, I will talk that in the transfer section. Uh, so, doc, like Dr. Lahiru mentioned, uh, at the incident also, there will be a, uh, this incident command. Uh, the incident command will be taken by the relevant sector. It will be a multi-sectorial approach. And uh, depending on the nature of the casualty, one department, take, take, uh, one department will take the overall uh, command and the other departments will have a command uh, command the, like the health command will be at the site, and uh, then the uh, the incident command will have this uh, responsibility like the safety of the uh, patient at the uh, the uh, staff at the staff and the patient and the onlookers all the safety will be on him until these tasks are uh, uh, assigned. And the communication and the assessment is an uh, ongoing process and which is very important. And then the uh, treaties, the trial treatment and transport. This is at the site of the uh, disaster. So one thing, uh, if one advantage of having an on-site uh, medical post is that we can actually sort out which patients should go, uh, go to which hospital. Because that is not there, we are receiving all three categories of patients. Because if it's possible, then the category three patients and category uh, three patients can be sent to another like less specialized hospital, and all the other cat one uh, the uh, priority one and two patients according to the triage can be sent to the peer. So uh, the field organization will be like this. Uh, so there will be a command post where the incident commander will be there and the other commanders and the holding point for uh, cat, uh, the priority three patients who are ambulatory will be taken to the holding point. And the collecting point is uh, where the uh, when the impact zone is unsafe, uh, we can quickly bring the patients to the collecting point and uh, then from there will be transferred to the advanced medical post. And uh, then in the advanced medical post, there will be like two or three, uh, uh, two like at least two uh, triage at the uh, entrance of the uh, advanced medical post as well as inside before transport. There will be another triage and uh, they will uh, decide who patient should go first. And uh, then the evacuation routes, the ambulance services. And even uh, uh, for the VIP, the politicians and the media will be at the side. So and uh, the, uh, so th there's a separate uh, area uh, uh, allocated for them. And uh, the triage process, uh, like I said, uh, usually there will be like two or three triages before the patient reaches the hospital. So here we don't have that. Uh, we get mostly untriaged patients uh, due to the above mentioned reasons. And uh, uh, it's a bit difficult to change that because that's the community response. So what we can do is to, uh, until the community get uh, like educated and uh, uh, they get the they get our intention, what we are doing and uh, until that, what we can do is to change our response according to the community's response. So what we are expecting is that uh, like uh, the our hospital, in disaster will be like the advanced medical post, both the advanced medical post and the center. So the triage will be done according to star triage. Uh, there's a triage bay uh, we have separated. Uh, and then uh, there will be uh, there will be a triage according to four categories, the red, yellow, green, and black. Red being critical uh, within five, 30 minutes we have to attend. 
and the yellow are the urgent to expected patients. We don't put the expectant patients among the dead because uh, there's some ethical issues, I will tell you. And uh, then the green patient, uh, the, the green patients are ambulatory patients, which can be uh, assessed later. So the, uh, in the start trials, there are mainly uh, three uh, components, the uh, respiration, perfusion, and the mental status. <clears throat> and then the transport. So we have prearranged agreement with the uh, traffic police in the area that uh, during, a, uh, during a mass casualty, there will be limited uh, tra uh, traffic in the Kaltar Matagama main road reaching the hospital. As well as in within the hospital, there will be uh, limited traffic. Only authorized person, persons and the ambulances will be uh, allowed, and all the uh, staff post, uh, staff uh, vehicles will be uh, removed from the A and &E premises, and there will be uniflow traffic within the premises. And uh, so, uh, since we are having like a scoop and run uh, method of uh, transporting patients. Uh, that path be cleared all the way. So we are having, we are taking uh, help from the usual. The security post will be uh, in charge of that. But if needed, we can take help from the uh, police and as the uh, SPF available in the area. <clears throat> and at the hospital, uh, like uh, the Flavio State. We have separate action cards as well as we have assigned a specific number of staff to an area. Otherwise, uh, all the because our people are very eager to help. There will be both the, the good Samaritans, the staff members, doctors, all will be coming into the hospital, uh, into the uh, treatment facility, and there will be chaos. So there will be a number assigned, like for the. Uh, this uh, unloading bay, we have assigned 15 healthcare assistants and for the, and uh, to uh, uh, transport patients within the facility to triage within the triage area uh, will be four. So all the excess staff and the good Samaritans and doctors will be kept outside the treatment area and will be called upon if needed. Uh, and uh, then the staff allocations we have to arrange again. Uh, we have given specific roles and they are to be the allocated area to the uh, staff. And uh, then they won't have any confusions regarding their uh, job. And all the staff identification will be color coded. There will be specific colors to the uh, the clinical commander and who is going to be the uh, this station day commander and who's going to look at the SSU and the mine stuff, they will get separate colors. And uh, then the crowd controlling and the, the maintaining of security will be uh, allocated to the hospital security and if needed, police and the SPA. And uh, then the evacuation plan for the involved patients managing the, in the uh, ANE setting. Again, a challenge for us. Uh, I'll come back to that as well. So the director. Or director or trans person will be the hospital incident commander, and uh, the uh, the director's office in the daytime or even uh, in the night. The admission, admission uh, administration at the admission office will be uh, taken as the command room. So, uh, regarding the registration, so other in the important aspects, the registration of patients and the documentation. So initially they will be given a number because uh, we don't have time to take a full uh, detailed histories that will be taken at the definitive treatment area in the ward or uh, in the uh, ICU or HDU anywhere. And uh, then the handling of patient belongs belongings. Uh, the, first the triage nurse will take command of that. He, she will, uh, according to the patient's number given, they will uh, be put into a bag and numbered and then handed over to the in charge nurses in the area, uh, in the relevant treatment area. And the dead bodies will be handled uh, handled by the uh, medical legal officer. And uh, before sending to the uh, mortuary, all the patients will be double shaped because uh, the dead has to be reconfirmed by a medical officer. And uh, regarding the information given to the public and the media, uh, the director will be in charge of that. And uh, 
or director authorized person and all the other staff are prohibited from talking to the uh, media or anyone outside authorities. So the other aspects I had, uh, I like to talk about is psychological first aid. So uh, in a disaster, so the community will be in distress as well as the as well as there will be psychological issues uh, to the rescuers as well. So to address that, uh, it's important to address that. And we have assigned uh, the consultant uh, psychiatrist with his uh, team to address it. Uh, usually, uh, it also needs to be happened at the site of the uh, disaster. But at the moment, we can only do that in the hospital premises. And then the logistics will be handled by the director or direct until someone is assigned to uh, take care of it. And as for the uh, uh, medical supply, we have separate disaster uh, cabinets maintained in the uh, uh, the A and E, as well as in other places where the where where units are involved in the disaster, like the blood bank, the theaters. They are expected to maintain the minimum disaster stocks. And if needed, we can uh, get the stocks from the storeroom or in, even in other even from other hospitals. That is uh, that is the responsibility of the administration officer. And then the legal and ethical considerations. So we have uh, it's difficult to do because uh, we have small uh, area to manage a large number of patients. So maintaining the patient's confidentiality, and uh, then the patient may not be able to give consent. So in those uh, scenarios, we have to do the best for the patients. Uh, do the best for the patients in my best interest. So, uh, and the ethical dilemmas, especially, uh, this is very applicable to the site of the uh, disaster. Like uh, when we are like we are trying to do most for the most patients. So try to save the greatest number of lives. So in that case. Sometimes we might have to give up on the uh, patients who are not having any uh, signs of life. So that patient might have arrested just a minute before, maybe 10 minutes before. So even if he has arrested one minute before, we might not be able to uh, spare uh, time to this taking. So it, uh, at that time, so and the other problem is uh, patients with unsalvageable injuries. Like the head injuries, we don't have the neurosurgical uh, facilities here. So the nearest hospital would be the National Hospital, which is so about 50 kilometers away. And for those patients, we might not be able to do anything. And unfortunately, uh, so we have to uh, tell that to the patients, loved ones. Like uh, we are not doing anything because uh, we don't have the facility or we are trying to uh, save the patients who are already alive. So uh, that will be hard and if the, the EMTs, the staff or everyone has to be trained how to address the uh, community, how to address the loved ones and how to break the bad news. So uh, where we can improve is, I think uh, like uh, this mentioned, uh, we have to arrange uh, training and drills programs. So it's, I think uh, recently uh, we didn't have any training on drills. So I think uh, while the, this topic is hot, I think uh, we should have a drill as soon as possible. And uh, because I think most of us are not familiar with this plan. So if a disaster anyhow happens, uh, I think we'll be in trouble. So we need to uh, get ourselves ready with that. And uh, then the community involvement, educating the community is very important. I think uh, this uh, this is where we can change the community's attitudes. Like, uh, like the yeah, I think the uh, the responsibility of first responder is to stop patient pay the unfriendly patients, uh, like uh, the witness arrange transfers from happening. But in our setting, I don't know uh, how we can say. It. The patient is transported. No way, this patient keep the patient here until the first responder. So the uh, this, uh, the medical team arrives here, and then they will decide how transfer when transport. Just that might uh, elicit uh, even aggression to assist staff. 
So we have to educate on that, educate them on that. And also uh, the fact that we are not going to, since we are trying to save the greatest number, we are not going to spare uh, any time or energy on patients who are already dead or not having any signs of life or having unsalvageable injuries. And then we can have volunteer assistance respond to programs, if possible. And uh, then the past uh, experiences. So we had several past experiences, both uh, pandemic wise, so and as well as the casual, the surgical casualties like the East Sunday attack, the tsunami, and then the COVID. So from that, I think, uh, like uh, Dr. Lahiri says. So we, uh, during the Easter Sunday attack, uh, I think we fared well, but still there are uh, areas where we could have improved. So we have to study these cases and uh, then learn from that and then plan. The plan, uh, the planning is a continuous process. So it's not about like, uh, not about creating a plan and then just put it in a cabinet. Okay, we have a disaster plan and then now uh, we are okay. Disaster plan, uh, disaster happens, we are ready. So it's a planning, it's a continuous process. So each year it has to be revised. And then uh, there's a lot of new things happening in the new facilities available, new resources available. So we have to take everything into consideration. Uh, and also, uh, we can use the uh, use of technology. I think uh, we are a bit moving towards the digital uh, uh, digitalization of our uh, information, and also uh, we can like uh, the even the electronic medical records. Now we are getting used to, and then telemedicine and GIC mapping. I think uh, we are not that far off. I think we can achieve that uh, in the near future, and then also uh, some adjustments they are using drones and uh, to either. Uh, to assess the scene or even to uh, transport the uh, of the medical supplies. And uh, then the international cooperation. So we have to uh, keep our uh, the international relationships healthy. And we also, in the past also, we received a lot of support from them even during the uh, uh, during a, a disaster, the Easter Sunday tsunami, we had a lot of uh, aid, both uh, technical support. And uh, then the sharing best, best practice site in this forum is a great example for that. We, have, we need to arrange more, uh, more forums like this and get their experience as well. So the challenges, uh, uh, so apart from those challenges, uh, so as a culture uh, uh, this uh, these are some of the challenges that we face. So this is our uh, treatment day during the during around, I think, nine, uh, around 3 a.m. So as you can see, there are a lot of unstable patients. We don't have any beds, so we are managing the patients in trolleys. So if a disaster happened at this stage, what are we going to do about the patients? Where are we going to send them? So this is a uh, very difficult task because these are CAT1, CAT2 patients. Some are even intubated patients are there, patients who are on NIV, and we have limited uh, HDU and IC facilities. So. In my opinion, we might not be able to send all the patients out, but uh, because uh, the intubated patients and uh, patients who are on NIV, we might have to keep and with those patients also, we had uh, with those patients uh, there, we have to manage the, uh, the uh, disaster. And then the, this is the only hospital with the uh, cardiac cat catheter lab available in the district. So the patients who are coming for, uh, coming for other diseases, like uh, even uh, the MI STEMI, uh, so those patients has to be accommodated as well. We can't ignore those patients as well. And uh, again, the stroke patients, uh, we are one of the two hospitals in the district with the CT facilities. And uh, we are doing the stroke thrombolization here. So all those patients, time quicker management has to go on during this uh, disaster management period. <laughs> So uh, to summarize, uh, I gave a brief introduction of mass, ca mass casualty and the steps uh, that are going to be taken in the mass casualty by our hospital and what are the standard steps. And then the problem and challenges we face and where we can improve. So my references. <clears throat> okay, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'll 
uh, time experience, uh, time restraints I had to run through the uh, presentation, but uh, I think you can understand this topic. Thank you.